production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. This time on Broad and High. Explore the latest interactive art exhibit at the Columbus Museum of Art. And this theme is about textiles. We have a place where people can make their own insects out of different textiles and build and make and create. We'll stop by the annual Gifts of the Craftsman sale in Grandview. And a new coffee table book celebrates the culture and creativity of Columbus. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hey everyone, I'm Kate Quickle and we're coming to you today from inside the beautiful Cultural Arts Center in downtown Columbus. But our first story tonight takes us down the street to the Columbus Museum of Art. Back in 2011, the museum unveiled its new interactive Wonder Room. It's an experimental art space where hands-on activities are featured prominently alongside great works of art. It's all intended to foster imagination and encourage visitors to think about art by looking, talking, and making together. The museum recently decided to reinvigorate the gallery, and we had a chance to check it out. Oh, well, the Wonder Room is a special gallery in the heart of our Chase Center for Creativity. It's an experimental gallery that opened in 2011, and it's in this space that we think differently about what an art museum gallery can be. And this theme is about textiles. The thing I love about textiles is they're pretty democratic. Everybody is comfortable with textiles. Everyone has clothing or rugs or blankets. Um, and you'll see a lot of those things in this space. We commissioned four artists to create special installations for the space. And of course, their works are all based around textiles also. Ogelia, who's a Brooklyn artist, um, is creating this amazing, magical entry. I kind of imagine like a portal to the rest of the gallery. So a lot of it is acrylic, um, kind of grandma quilts that people don't know what, you know, where they fit in their lives. And I kind of want to show just the beauty in them that sometimes people pass by. Um, Kelly Martin is working behind me probably right now and she's a Columbus-based fashion designer and she's created a really interesting activity that people can work on to create their own fashion design. Um, I'm really excited because this project kind of brings out my more vibrant, bright neon side. Um, I was told that the project is kind of a Mad Max meets Jim and the Holograms, which when I heard that I was like, you get me, this is my life. I'm more Mad Max now, but I used to be gym in the hologram, so the combination is perfect, pretty ugly, kind of what my whole vibe is anyway. So the idea is to create shapes with different closures and connectors in order for the museum goers to come in and really use technical and creative thinking in order to put these pieces together to create garments on dress forms. Um, it is a bit of a challenge because in my mind I'm thinking about creating garments that go together perfectly, uh, but that's not the idea of this. This is really to open up the mind of the person that's playing with the pieces in order to see what their idea of what a garment would be. It doesn't even really have to be a garment, it's kind of just covering the dress form in a creative way. I really think that kids and adults are going to absolutely love it because, you know, everyone wears clothes. Um, so it'll be unique to see how they put it together. I'm sure the kids are going to love the colors, a lot of neons, um, but there's also a lot of metallics and a lot of cool metal trims and things like that that can really, I think, stimulate anyone's creativity for sure. I am creating a giant textile spider web. 
because I think I was a little bit inspired by James and the Giant Peach, you know, all the bugs hanging out and the, the Giant Peach and having a party and going on adventures. And so, and I love bugs um, and I also love textiles. So I just, I thought it would be a great medium to explore. And I thought people would love making their own bugs too. I'm also using a bunch of blankets and uh, ponchos that were actually my husband's grandmother's that she hand knit. And so I kept all these blankets and I'm repurposing them in ways that would probably make her very angry um, because I'm <laughs> tearing them apart and repurposing them. There aren't spaces that have work from the collection, new commissioned works and interactive activities for people like all in the same space. So it's a pretty exciting, um, it's a pretty exciting venue to work in. So I feel pretty privileged to be able to do that. I think the experience we want all visitors to have in every gallery is to really stop and take time to know, really look at works of art and think about them, right? And so in the Wonder Room, where we really change things up is to design the space intentionally to create this awe and wonder, to promote curiosity, where people really stop and say, whoa, what is that? We are at the forefront of really learning about our visitors and understanding what they need, what their expectations are for a great art museum visit. So I think there are other museums doing this, but I have to say, I think the Columbus Museum of Art is the best. <laughs>
by a newspaper woman uh, in France. So it's a white clay covered board that has black ink over it. By doing the drawing with white pencil, then getting a knife, and in my case a sharp knife, and a glass of wine, so I drink and play with knives, uh, and you scratch away the black to expose the white underneath. So what you end up with is a black and white original illustration. So I take a 200 year old process, okay, girl from the old world, and I bring it into the 21st century, growing up in America, okay, and I scan it into Photoshop, and do a high resolution scan and then I paint everything in Photoshop. So I apply the color in Photoshop. Visual storytelling, that's, that's what my entire life is about. Everyone can relate to the piece because it says something to them. I don't care if it has a Greek, an ancient Greek meaning to it or a Greek landscape to it or an animal. The, everyone looks at it and sees a story. We are so glad because, you know, we want to support our local art community and this gives us an opportunity to present it to the public because we have this space. However, I'd like to add that after the holidays, we are still open and throughout the year we maintain three rooms here that are gift shops. So some of these items will still be here for the rest of the year for those weddings and those birthdays and anniversaries. The Gifts of the Craftsman sale is happening through December 23rd. Visit ohiocraft.org for details. When Alexia Winfield moved to Columbus a few years ago, she set out to discover all the city had to offer. Her explorations led her to develop and publish two coffee table books that celebrate the culture and creativity of our Central Ohio community. Here's a preview. So I uh, came to Columbus seven years ago and I was recruited to work for a bank in town and I knew nothing about Columbus. I had no family, I had no friends. I uh, was here for a little bit, um, maybe a few weeks and I'm like, no, I can't stay here. Like, I hate it. I hate Columbus. Like, I can't acclimate. But after two years of living in Polaris, I said, you know what, I have to move downtown. I have to, like, just explore the city a bit more. And I just started going places by myself. I just started exploring and kind of fast forward. I moved, I'm in downtown for a few years. I met, I met my friend's art studio and she had two coffee table books and nothing to do with Columbus, just arts book. And I was like, you know what? Why don't we do a book about Columbus, fashion, art, culture? And she was like, oh my gosh, that's perfect. And I'm the type of person, like if I have an idea, like I'm gonna execute it. Like there's just no if, ands or buts about it. We wanted this to be like a tour guide. I, mean, I pretty much created something I wish I had when I first got here. I learned so much about the city through this book. I was already in love with Columbus. I have no plans of ever going anywhere else, but through this book, the way I look at it is that it really is a treasure map, a visual treasure map of the city. So we have two coffee table books. Uh, they're together 550 pages, so they're at least 250 pages each. They're originally just supposed to be one book, so with everything that we had and everything that the city has to offer, it was hard to eliminate anything. So we decided two books, and the two book set is actually called Immerse, and in that is books Explore and Reveal. So one of the great things about having it as a set is that when you put the books together, as they're meant to be, on the spine, it reads Columbus against the two books in the two different colors, black and white. So the way I like to talk about it is that the books are meant, you should go out and explore the city because there's so much to reveal and you're really going to have the most immersive journey if you are able to, you know, leaf through both of them. I want people to understand just like there is just so many different lifestyles that you can have when you come to Columbus and I made a conscious decision when I moved here I was like I want a certain lifestyle and I'm going to make that happen in Columbus. I don't have to be in LA, I don't have to be in New York. I can have that lifestyle in Columbus and that's what I do. I really think there is something for everyone. 
in these books. Whether you've been a longtime resident or you're a transfer like our founder, Alexia, that we really talk in a way about these places and really show them visually in a way that you may not have seen or even thought to experience that way before. It's taken us two and a half years to get here, but we're super proud of the work that we've done. Uh, and we're excited to kind of show the world what Columbus has to offer. Learn more about the Columbus Book Project and find out where you can purchase your own copy at columbusbookproject.com. So the artist in this next story also has a coffee table book of kittens. We here at Broad and High love our four-legged furry friends, and so does photographer Sarah Beth Earnhardt. Her subjects are simply adorable. I usually say that my work is fun and modern. It's very bright and colorful, and I feel like it's very real, very honest. I really try to capture the personality and spirit of my subjects. I never set out to be a pet photographer. I came about it very organically. I've always been an animal lover and I went to school for graphic design and through that job I kind of got into photography professionally and I started photographing kids and families and weddings and discovered that wasn't really for me. So I started volunteering with some pet rescues and that got me involved with other pet businesses and it grew from there. It was a part-time thing and now it's full-time and I love it. Obi, do you, do you want to have a treat? Ah, Obi. Can see Bill shake for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coming into the studio is a very strange experience for a lot of animals and they do tend to be kind of excitable or nervous. Just kind of having a routine helps keep the sessions going smoothly and animals is on a much different communication level and they're not always going to do what you want them to do. I love my clients' relationships with their pets. Their pets are their children in a sense. And it's such a sweet and a very short-lived relationship, which I think it makes them embrace it a little more because they know they only have a short amount of time. And a, par a big part of what I do is end-of-life photography sessions for terminally ill and elderly pets. Just seeing the relationships that these people have had, it's the best part of what I do is really the owners and the interacting and hearing about all of their wonderful experiences with their pets. We did a photo shoot, I think like five years ago, and it was in the fall, I remember, because then we did our Christmas cards. Our pets are our kids, basically. I mean, we don't have children. We love them. They're a huge part of our lives. It seems like it would be unnatural to me not to have professional photography of our animals. Good boy! Sometimes I think about what I do and I just have to laugh because I, this is what I do. I photograph pets and so many people that I meet are like, oh my gosh, you have my dream job. I would love to do this. I think from the outside, people think that it's really just playing with animals all the time and it's so much work. But the hour that I get to spend with some amazing animal makes all the rest of it totally worth it. And I don't know, I can't imagine doing anything else. Rooted in tradition and ceremony, tribal regalia and dancing are important parts of Native American culture. Hundreds of dances exist, performed by tribes across the United States. Our friends at Twin City PBS in Minnesota bring us this next story that explores the meaning, history, and regalia of three unique Native American dances.
I love to dance because it gives me so much life. When I dance, I feel uplifted, rejuvenated, and I feel a sense of pride. When I dance, I really represent where I come from and my family and my tribe. The symbols on my outfit and all these designs are designs that I made, and so it's just a really good feeling. When I started dancing, I was probably about 17. I was just a senior in high school. My mom helped me buy uh, my first outfit, and then I kind of just started dancing from there. This one right here, this is the actually the first outfit I made. It kind of means a lot more to me than the others because I made this one with my mom. This one is my latest. has a, like a lot of detail on it. Took a long time to complete. These are um, Pawnee stars. They're like the tribal symbol. And then this is just like a, a teepee design that I kind of came up with. It feels really good to dance and to, to know that everything that I am wearing, every design is like made by me. It just makes it that much more meaningful. <laughs> The grass dance is one of the older styles of dance. Back when tribes would come to a new place to make a, an encampment, they would uh, have these songs and they would dance in a certain way to lay the grass down. When they would leave that encampment, that grass would come back up. It would almost be like they were never there. was a very young girl. I want to say three or four were my earliest memories of dancing. When I was maybe 10 years old, my cousins, they danced Fancy Shaw and I danced Jingle. And it's shown itself to me in a spiritual sense that that's the style of dance that I'm supposed to stick with. <laughs> This dress represents healing and life and is a tool that we were given as Anishinaabe people to bring healing to the community. One thing that the jingles are said to do are to send out that vibration, energy, to, you know, loosen up that whatever sickness that is being targeted and thought of and prayed for and to pull it through the cone. And then once they're clashing, that they're dropping that medicine, that sickness behind you. There's two styles of jingle dress. There's the original style, and there is the second style, which is contemporary, which has a lot more intricate footwork. But the style that I dance is original. Really simple, elegant steps, you know, to the beat of the drum. People have approached me and told me that I look like I'm floating. I've been dancing since the time I could walk. I've always danced woman's traditional style of dance. I wear a broadcloth dress. I really like to keep my dresses looking traditional. Our dance clothes and our dances are really important and are really sacred to us.
The style of dance honors the returning home of the warrior while he was off and away on hunting expeditions or in battle. The reason why I dance the style of dance is because I really like to remember my ancestors, especially the women, and to show their strength and the courage that they had. Powwows have become universal among all tribes, so I'm just really thankful for the opportunity to be a part of the circle. Dancing helps me focus, think, and brings me a lot of happiness and gives my family life. It's very important that you learn the history and the, and the pass that on to my kids and to keep that tradition alive and so we don't lose it. That's our show. Remember, you can revisit all of our stories at WOSU.org, as well as on the WOSU Public Media mobile app. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. Be sure to join us back here next week with more great stories on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at ColumbusMakesArt.com and PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you.